we need to talk. There's been a lot of talk about Moore's Law lately. There's articles on the internet that are talking about how dead it is, and then other articles talking about how very much alive it is. Welcome to the internet. But in this Decoder episode, my explainer series here on the channel, I want to talk about what Moore's Law actually is, whether it's dead or not, and why it's being talked about so much lately. And if you're wondering why New York City has so many palm trees and sand, well, I'm actually in California right now, for MediaTek, who recently became the world's largest smartphone chip maker. Crazy. But they have an annual summit, and we're here for that. And I also partnered with them to make this video, because if anyone's gonna help me get to the bottom of Moore's Law, it's probably them. So Gordon Moore, who eventually went on to co-found Intel, once said in an article published in 1965 that he predicted that the number of components per square inch on a microchip would double every year. Now he made this prediction based on historical data at the time, and he published this chart along with his paper. Now a friend and colleague of Dr. Moore's and a professor at Caltech, Dr. Carver Mead, once called the theory Moore's Law and it has been referred to as such ever since. Even though it's not technically a law in like physics terms, it's more like an observation or a theory. And then 10 years after that, in 1975, Moore actually revised his theory and changed it to doubling every two years. Now, if you wanna read the paper, I've linked it below along with an interesting transcription of an interview from Moore in 2005 discussing his law. Bottom line though, Moore was trying to get across the idea that by putting more components on each chip, that the cost of electronics would ultimately go down. And of course, performance would be increased as well. Here's why. Now this is an oversimplification, but just to illustrate the point. Essentially, these chips or dies they're called, are cut out of silicon wafers of a specific size, a common one being 300 millimeters, for example. So if each silicon wafer costs a flat rate of X, then the cost per chip you produce from that wafer goes down the more chips you can squeeze onto that same sized wafer. As you divide X by more chips, the cost per chip goes down to produce, at least in theory, and that is how it worked for a while, not so much anymore, but we'll get to that. The other benefit though of this miniaturization is that with any semiconductor manufacturing, there's also a certain amount of defective chips that are produced and thrown out. The smaller the chips on the wafer, the less will be defective. So there's just more sellable inventory. So yields go up, profits go up, costs can come down slightly. And lastly, this race to get smaller also has another benefit, which is speed. The transistors, the basic building blocks of what make a computer chip work, are in again, in oversimplification, a switch with two conductive contacts, usually called a source and drain, separated by some space that when a current is applied to the gate, which is the name of the part between them, allows electrons to pass between them and turns the switch on or off, zero or one. Now, the smaller the transistors are, the smaller the gap between the conducts. And we're talking even the difference in nanometers. The less those electrons have to travel, and so the faster they can and the more performance we'll get out of them. Also, the power needed to be applied to that gate is less, and so the whole system uses less power. And there are billions of these on a chip nowadays. With the more we have, the better performance in running calculations and changing all those ones and zeros simultaneously. And all that translates to less expensive technology, like what Moore was referring to, and better performance exponentially. Now this doesn't include other costs, obviously, like the research and development costs or the capital costs for the machines to make these smaller and smaller chips. But for 50 years or so, that doubling of transistors every two years was holding true. It even started to become a self-fulfilling prophecy with large companies using Moore's law as guidance on what the rest of the industry would be doing. And so if they didn't meet those numbers, they'd be left behind by competitors. And when you have a $500 billion a year industry and some the brightest engineers on the planet all working at this at the same time, it tends to move forward. Now, a few years after Moore made his initial prediction, that friend that named it his law actually also kind of predicted when it would start to have issues. Dr. Carver Mead set out to research just what benefits miniaturization would bring and give some practicality to Moore's law. He figured out that without changing anything about the components, and how they worked or what they were made of, etc., and simply miniaturizing them, that it would decrease power consumption by the decrease in size squared. So making something 10 times smaller would make it use 100 times less power. Or another way to look at that is you could put 100 times more transistors on a chip and it would use the same amount of power. And performance would go up by that same decrease cubed. So 10 times smaller 
meant a thousand times faster. He then went on in a later paper to hypothesize that you could probably get to about 100 million transistors per square centimeter if you don't change anything at all simply by making the components smaller and smaller. And at that point, you would start to have issues. Well, we got to that point and we started having some issues. So this whole hotel feels like it's upside down because when you're at your room, to go to the lobby, you actually have to push it up. The lobby is above us. And in the lobby, you have to push it down. You go to your room. It's, it just feels upside down. Not the worst place to have a tech convention in November. So one of the interesting issues that began to happen that's important for us to think about now is the fact that the gap between those conducts would get so small at some point that you wouldn't be able to stop electrons jumping it to get from one conduct to the other. And even if you place something in between them, thanks to a phenomenon called quantum tunneling, which is a thing that we can't really explain, but it's proven to happen over and over, electrons can actually just pass through the object. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out my Decoder episode on quantum computing at the link below. But in about 2005, around 30 years or so after Dr. Carver Mead's paper in 1971, following the same trajectory as Moore's law, companies had to experiment with other materials, changing the geometry of the transistors themselves, even going vertical with the gate instead of horizontal, and building things in a more sophisticated way to get around the limitations that he discussed in order to get any smaller and also squeeze out more performance. And it's then that we start to see Moore's law falter a bit and get a little less accurate, at least in its strictest terms, ever since then. We didn't say that you couldn't make transistors smaller than this. We just said when you got there, you would start to have problems that weren't solvable just by scaling and doing everything else the same. You may have heard of a specific number followed by the words nanometer process, i.e. 8 nanometer, 5 nanometer, etc. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And this nanometer process was once describing the size of the smallest element of the chip, usually the gap between the source and the drain on the transistor. At some point with those new types of transistors, that, that wasn't really possible to do anymore. And so that name kind of just became a marketing term. And industry people just kind of knew whoever was making the chipset and whatever the name of their nanometer process was, that it would have X performance or X battery life, etc. Like TSMC's seven nanometer would do X and Intel's 14 nanometer might do something similar, even though they have different names and so on and so forth. And it's only recently the consumers are even starting to see these process names. And here at this event, actually, MediaTek just announced that they're the first ones to use TSMC's four nanometer process, which is obviously improved upon from the five nanometer process that everyone else is using. The new flagship chipset for MediaTek called the Dimensity 9000 will have the benefits from going to a newer process node for performance and power, but is also the first mobile chipset with the faster LPDDR5X memory, hitting up to 7,500 megabits per second, the first with the ability to hit up to 320 megapixels for camera capture, and they even have managed to hit the highest N22V9, a popular benchmarking app, score ever verified by Antutu, all while doing so using 40% less power than previous generations during idle, 65% less during media playback, and 25% less during gaming. It's the first properly flagship chipset from MediaTek and will be in phones as soon as the end of Q1 2022. All right, it is closing night of the MediaTek Summit and we have a dinner and like a cornhole tournament happening behind me. Just like a game where you throw beanbags into a piece of wood with a hole in it. I'm just hoping not to come last. That's really my only goal. But while we're here, let's talk about the future of all this. And before we do that, let's just simply answer the question. Is Moore's law dead? Well, if you take it by its strictest definition, which in Moore's paper was that the number of transistors would double per square inch every two years, then yes, Yes, it is dead. Because honestly, it did start to slow down when we had to switch to different transistor types and use more and more complex methods to make the components of the chips. It only really held true as hard as it did when we were simply miniaturizing everything on the chipset, but not changing that much. And because of the cost of all that new machinery and the time that it now takes for all of these new processes, the costs of the chips 
are not going exponentially down like they were, which again was a big part of Moore's law as he talks about cost a lot in his paper. Truth is though that even if that progress has slowed down, the industry has not. We are still miniaturizing things, just like that four nanometer process that the MediaTek Dimensity 9000 is using. And TSMC, the foundry that MediaTek uses, has already announced their three nanometer process, which will happen in 2023, three nanometer E, which will happen in 2024 abouts, and they even start talking about their two nanometer process, although they only just gave us a date of when to possibly expect it of 2025. And besides the new processes, there's something else that's starting to happen now that's kind of interesting to me, and that's seeing companies make custom chipsets based on their applications, which are called ASICs, or Application Specific Integrated Circuit. This is what the Apple M1 and Google Tensor chipsets are technically, as they are custom built for the devices that they're going into to be better at that specific task, versus just being generically better at computations. MediaTek actually already does this with all of the Amazon Echo devices that you most likely already have in your home as they are the leading producer of those chipsets and have customized them to meet Amazon's specific needs. They even mentioned at the event how since they make chipsets for such a wide range of devices from exercise equipment to mobile of course to headphones and tons of others, they are well equipped to make these custom ASICs for other companies and are pursuing that further in the near future. It's just another method of getting more performance while lowering costs besides the forever push to make things smaller and I think we'll see a lot more of it. So even though Moore's law is slowing by its strictest definition, the industry just keeps pushing forward. So you guys, I have to go play Cornhole. So hope that was helpful for you guys. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of the video. Um, also, subscribe to the channel if you're not already and ding the bell so you get notified when I do new videos. And as always, thanks for watching. I'm Cogfish, by the way. It's Kogan and Fisher. We, we're not that clever with coming up with names.